Purpose does not advertise itself. Let someone remember that. The journey to destiny does not advertise itself. You have to take the opportunities. You have to grasp them. You have to know that this is for me. If I let this one go, I may never have another one. Welcome back, everybody. We're here again on set, filming episode five. It's myself, Sam, and my brother, Boss. Two men breaking bread. Recently, actually, somebody asked me, what does that actually mean, breaking bread? And I realized we haven't taken the time to explain what breaking bread means. We so, have. Yeah, we will, we will take some time to actually explain that later. But in a nutshell, maybe we'll give you guys some research. What does breaking bread mean? And I'll give a hint. It has nothing to do with bread physically. But there is something else being broken. There's something else happening when we say two men breaking bread. And it's, it's not just uh, random words, but I think it's, it's a lifestyle we're trying to bring back of breaking bread with one another, sitting down with someone and breaking bread, not just the name is two men breaking bread, but it could be two women breaking bread. It could be two children breaking bread, whatever it is. We just want to encourage those authentic, genuine conversations that people used to have face to face and just sitting down. Just like the Bible says, it is good for brethren to dwell together. Yes. Yeah. And the Apostle Paul actually encourages people when they meet together to, to talk about the Word of God. And in the Old Testament, God also tells Joshua to meditate on the Word of God day and night. So that's another hint. Well, the bread that we are talking about is not the literal bread. Though there was time for that, at one point in the ministry of Jesus Christ, he was teaching his uh, followers, and they got to a point where people were hungry. They wanted some food. And the Bible bears record that he stopped and he fed them. He gave them food. So that's an example of breaking bread. But in this context here, uh, it's, it's not about the physical bread. If it was about the physical bread, we will be eating right now, though you still owe me bread. So. Soon enough, I, I just have to find the right bakery. <laughs> Last time we were here, we began our discussion on purpose. And we said that's one of the biggest questions in life. What is my purpose? How do I figure out my purpose? And I think we spent some good time, about an hour or so, speaking on purpose. And it's one of those things where, although we spoke an hour on purpose, we couldn't have covered everything. So today I want to continue where we left off, but I just want to take it in a different direction. And maybe I just want to begin after someone has watched that last episode. We finished off by saying the best way to figure out your purpose is to go to your maker. Your maker can help you understand and tell you what your purpose is. Now, someone has watched that episode. They've done exactly that. They've gone back to God in prayer and they've asked God, what is my purpose? What is the reason I was made? And they've gone through that time of repentance, that time of washing and cleansing and giving themselves over and consecrating themselves over to God for, to fulfill their purpose. And they've even gone as far as understanding their purpose. In one way or another, God has spoken to them, has shown them exactly what he wants them to do. They're in that position. They know what they need to do. But now the problem is they feel like they don't have what it takes. The task that God has given them to do, they feel they're not, they're not ready or they don't have what it takes. They don't have all the tools the capacity to do what God has called them to do. How do you help such a person in that, in that state? There are a couple of things that uh, pop out for me when you, when you make that, that statement and you formulate it in that way. The first one is, why do you feel inadequate? Uh, and how, the second one is, how do you go about fulfilling that purpose once you know what it is? Because on one hand, the, we, we sometimes deal with uh, this imposter syndrome where you know what you're supposed to do, but you feel like you're not enough for the job. Mm -hmm. You feel like someone else is the right person for it. It's possible to feel like that, but we have to remember with a divine purpose comes divine strength. If God has revealed to you what he has called you to do, he will also equip you with the tools that are necessary for you to do it. Mm -hmm. Let's get that out of the way first of all. God can't call a man to do a job without equipping him with the necessary tools to carry out the task. That's, it would be unfair, so true. Yeah. Exactly, you will be judging a man without equipping him with the necessary things to do it, so he's bound to fail. Mm -hmm. 
And I can think of uh, a man like David. I can't say that he was born to kill Goliath, but what I can say is he was, he was born to be a king. Mm -hmm. That was his purpose in serving God here on earth. But the way to the throne is guarded by Goliath. You can't get to the throne without overcoming the giants who are guarding that throne. And these giants are there to scare the people who were not called for the throne. Mm -hmm. They are not there to scare the David away from the position. They are there to weed out those right. people who want the throne but are not made of the king material. Mm -hmm. So David came to face Goliath with a slingshot. Now Saul was the king, he had everything. He had the armor, he had the sword. He tried to lend that to David and David said, I wasn't made for that, I can't fight with your things. Mm -hmm. Trying to show you that sometimes the things that you have already may seem like they're incompetent and they are not the right tools, but that's exactly what you need for that job. Yeah, that is so true. I think of another man like Moses, when he's in, at the burning bush, and God tells him, I'm going to use you to deliver my children of Israel. We find that he is giving God rebuttals every time. But I'm not enough. You know, I, I, I can't speak well. I'm a stummer. I'm weak. I'm 80 years old now at this point in my life. I think there's always going to be a reason why you can't do something. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be a reason you can think of or find why you can't fulfill your purpose or why you can't be the man or the woman God called you to be. But as much as you may have a reason, God also has a reason why you are the exact right person for the job. That's right. And that's what he did with Moses. Yeah. Everything Moses told him was the reason why he couldn't fulfill his purpose. He told him, no, you have, you're saying this, but here's a solution why. Yes, you're a stummer, but I'm preparing your brother Aaron also. He'll help you in that area. So like you said, for every divine mission, God will give you the divine tools to fulfill the purpose. Yeah. That's a very good answer for the person who's in that state. Yes. But I find even that in itself, they may, they may know these are the tools that I have to do the job. But then something else gets in the way. Fear of actually going out there and, and beginning to do what you're supposed to do. Fear that maybe I'll get out there and what if the people don't accept me? What if the place that I'm supposed to fulfill my purpose isn't ready for me? How do you address such a person? We should keep in mind that fear is not a godly thing. The Bible bears record that God did not give us the spirit of fear. So whenever you're dealing with fear, you are dealing with an evil spirit. And that evil spirit comes to paralyze you. Fear can make you look at things and overestimate their impact. Fear can make you look at the enemy and overestimate his strength and underestimate your own strength. So to get rid of fear, God gives us a spirit of power. That the Spirit of God gives you power. And power, the power of God that he gives you, is enough for you to overcome any obstacle in life. When David was facing Goliath, he didn't go in the valley afraid of Goliath. He went in the valley singing victory already. Because he knew that God who is sending him there will deliver him. Mm. So he could already pronounce that judgment upon Goliath and say, Today you will go down, I'll cut off your head. Because he knew to him, as long as God is backing me up, those are the divine tools that I talk about, that slingshot, it's an ordinary one. It's not so special. It's not made of any special materials. The same slingshots kids play with and mm -hmm. he was using yesterday. But now, God is the one who's using it. Yeah. So he goes out there and he faces the enemy and it does wonders. Mm -hmm. And if you had told Goliath that it will take a stone to get you down, he wouldn't have believed you. I mean, a man of his size, to imagine that would just be nearly impossible. Yeah. And uh, something today, many times we have fear and we should ask ourselves, what are we scared of? Am I scared of disappointing God? Or am I scared of disappointing others? Or am I scared of failure? If you are scared of failure, you should never try anything in life. Every successful person on earth has encountered failure. Success is born out of failure. There is no such a thing as I always hit 100% of my shots. It doesn't work. At least for human beings, it doesn't work. I think it's, uh, is it Edison or Tesla who said he made nine, 999 failures before the one worked and he was able to discover electricity. 
one of those. I yeah. So we have to keep in mind that the fear of failure should not stop you from doing what you're called to do. Mm-hmm. You will fail. Moses, he knew he was born with a divine purpose. He had a special calling in his life. And his mama was probably telling him that every day as she was taking care of him in the house of Pharaoh. And at one point in his life, when he was about 40 years old, he tried to carry out the mission on his own. He killed an Egyptian. He failed. That was a man trying to do God's purpose or God's mission in a manly way. And fear drove him away. Fear drove him away. But notice, God sends him back. He has had an encounter with God. And notice that the encounter with God gets rid of fear. Mm -hmm. The same people he was scared of, he's now going to face them without an army. And he's going to face them Mm -hmm. older than he was when he left them. Mm -hmm. And he's only coming with a rod. Where is that fear? Mm -hmm. It's gone. Why did it go? Because I met someone who is much stronger and does not understand fear. He doesn't deal with fear because to him, everything moves at his word, including me. I'm moving at his word. Mm -hmm. And the word of God gives you strength. You know, there is a scripture in the Bible in Matthew 4 where Jesus tells the devil when he comes to tempt him that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It shows something interesting. We speak about that when you're speaking about bread and things. But it also shows us you have a choice to live by bread alone. Yeah. But what does that mean? Bread will decay at some point. And so will your body. So if you live by bread alone, you will grow old. Mm -hmm. You will decay. You will die at some point. But if you live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, the word of God will never pass away. So when you look at it from that perspective, fear goes away. Yeah. If God said it, it can't fail. It will never pass away, for the word of God does not return to him without fulfilling the purpose for which it was sent. So I may be one man, and so I will carry out a one-man invasion. Like Gideon, I'm a nobody, but God has said it. I will go and do it. So you deal with fear by, first of all, having an encounter with God. When you have an encounter with God, it changes you. You can never meet God and remain the same. And, and, and that's the thing about fear. Fear cripples. Fear, when we think about fear just, just in the natural sense, say, for example, you're out for a walk and out of the blue, a lion shows up. In that moment, for most people, what kicks in is fear. Mm-hmm. Usually your knees will begin to tremble. Your hands will begin to shake. Your heart rate begins to pump up really quickly. And you, ha- you experience what we call the fight or flight response. Either you stay and fight or you run away. Fear kicks in in that moment. But what fear does in that moment, it can cripple you to the point where you can't move, you freeze. And that's exactly what I think the enemy tries to do with God's children. When God's children have discovered what their purpose is in life, he knows if they fulfill that purpose, that's it, I can't do anything else. So what can I do in this moment? Let me send fear their way. And like you said earlier, fear never comes from God. So anytime you're you're in a state of fear, it's never from God. But you have to ask yourself, what is this fear meant to do? That fear in that moment is meant to stop you from doing anything. Mm -hmm. Fear is meant to stop you in your tracks so that you can't take a step forward. And that's the most dangerous thing where you know what you're supposed to do for God, but you choose to stay frozen. You choose to stay where you are. Now, you can either make a choice to stay in that fear, or like you said, you can choose to believe that the God who has given me this purpose will also provide everything I need to overcome and fulfill this purpose. He will look out for me because when God gives you a purpose, as much as you have a stake in that purpose, God also has a bigger stake in that purpose. Because what the Bible tells us, whatever word comes out of God, it doesn't come back to him void. It yeah. must fulfill the purpose by which it was sent out. So if God has given you his word, one thing is true. That purpose of that word will be fulfilled. That's right. You have a part to play in that purpose. Now, the enemy will try to convince you that maybe you don't have what it takes, like we were talking about earlier. Maybe you don't have all the skills. Maybe you need to wait longer. I can remember in my own journey, when I first started in the ministry, and I knew this is what God had called me to do. But as much as I knew it's what God called me to do, there was still that aspect of fear. What if I go up there and I preach my first sermon and nobody likes it? Or what if I go up there and I preach and everybody just tells me, man, you wasted our time. There's always that aspect of fear, which is natural. It'll happen. Yeah. But you have a choice when, you're, when there's fear. You have a choice to either say, you know what, the fear is there, 
but I'm still going to make a step forward. Or you can say, because there is fear, I'm not going to make a step forward. And that's where the enemy gets you. And that's where it's so dangerous. When you were talking about that, I just remembered something. Have you heard of the baby elephant syndrome? No. Okay, so the baby elephant syndrome, uh, uh, I'm paraphrasing here. It's, it's a story. It states that if you take a baby elephant uh, and you tie it with a rope and uh, it will try to run away, it will try to break that rope, it will try to go away. But because it's young, it's weak, it won't be able to do it. So the story goes to say that it will try a couple of times and then eventually it will give up. But what is happening is it's actually growing stronger. It's gr- getting bigger and stronger. And eventually it will attain maturity. But it will be wired to believe that it can't break that rope. The thing is, it has grown stronger and gotten bigger, but it still evaluates itself, its ability to break that rope on the, its strength at an early age. So. That is what fear does to people. The thing that is holding back this elephant from breaking away from that rope is the wiring. It has been wired to believe that that rope is stronger than it is. But the truth of the matter is it is actually stronger than that rope. It's just that when it was bound, it wasn't strong enough to break it. But now it's actually strong. Baby elephant. Yeah. Interesting analogy, but very true. Very true. <laughs> so that's, that's what happens actually to a lot of people. Fear is a very dangerous thing, but it's good to think about it that way, that you have a choice when fear is there. It doesn't feel in that moment like you have a choice. Like it, it, you might feel like there is no other way out of this, but there is always a choice, and especially when it comes to fear. And the best thing you can do if you really don't know what to do, go back on your knees. Go back on your knees and tell God, I'm in a moment of fear, but I know that I have to take an action. I have to make a choice, but I just, I just need your strength right now to overcome this fear. And I am certain 100%, it's only a matter of time before you get that strength to overcome that fear. But boss, I want to go back to one of the things you mentioned earlier, David's life. As you said, he had a purpose. His purpose wasn't to defeat Goliath. That was part of the purpose. But like you said, he was anointed to be king of Israel. But let's talk about that journey to that throne because it's an unconventional journey. It's, it's not a journey that you would expect, especially when you're being anointed to be king when there's already someone on the seat. That, that's not something conventional. And I want to talk about that because a lot of times when God gives you a purpose or you discover your purpose in life, your God-given purpose, mm-hmm. God will tell you your purpose, but oftentimes he doesn't tell you what it's going to take to get there to fulfill that purpose. And that's exactly what happened with David. David's journey, just walk us through that. From the point God anoints him and tells him you're going to be king of Israel to the point where he actually ends up on the throne. Yeah. Uh, David is an interesting character, and I think he is a representation of all of us in life. Imagine you have brothers and you are the least in the family, so you tend to be forgotten. Well, not these days. The young ones tend to be the ones with all the tantrums and always remembered at home, but... The favorites. The favorites. You you picture yourself, today we can compare him to the middle child. Mm -hmm. The middle child who's always forgotten unless they're having a panic attack and then everybody remembers them for a minute. So David is forgotten by his family. His dad is sending him out there to take care of his sheep. And uh, when he is taking care of uh, the flock, in the back, he is expressing a certain level of commitment that pleases God. And it's not recorded there immediately, but later on the Bible says, when a lion came and tried to take one of his uh, sheep, sheep, he says he killed the lion and rescued the lamb. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the bear. So God was looking at the man who's faithful that not even one of his uh, sheep will be lost. He looks at that integrity and he sees the love that he has for him. God says, I've found a man after my own heart. So he sends the prophet Samuel to anoint him to be the one who will take over or succeed, the the successor of Saul. But his relationship with God is good. God gives him the promise of the throne. All of that is great. The prophet Samuel, he was a highly respected prophet in Israel. He comes, he anoints him with oil. So at that point, there is no question about the legitimacy of the prophecy and the promise. And with that also comes the, def- the definition of his purpose. Go, go back a minute yeah. first before he even anoints him. Let's talk about that selection process, actually. Yes. Because that's very important. 
a lot of times, and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, imposter syndrome, where you might think you're not the right man for the job. In David's home, when Samuel came to anoint, even Samuel made the mistake to think that the oldest in the family, the other brothers of his, were fit for the job. Yes. So even a prophet of God misunderstood who was right for the job. Yeah. Because as human beings, sometimes we have a tendency to look at things from the outside perspective. Mm -hmm. But God says, don't look at the outside appearance. I look at the heart. I look at the heart. Most of the times, even as ourselves, we can be looking at each other and we are judging ourselves based on what we are seeing around us. You look at yourself, for instance, and you see, um, you know, I'm just wearing ordinary Walmart, Costco, or whatever cheap uh, store you go to to get your clothes. And I have an Apple Watch, man. It's not <laughs> you have an Apple Watch. Yeah. yeah. But you, you, you look at the person next to you and they're mm-hmm. wearing designer clothes. Mm-hmm. So you begin to, to, to compare yourself. Yeah. And that's what, what's going to happen is you will begin to feel some way inferior to that person. At mm-hmm. least for most people, that's how they feel. Mm-hmm. But the experienced one, they know, oh no, it's not about the designer clothes. It's not about this and that. It's about what I'm carrying inside. Mm -hmm. You begin to look at yourself, not from an outside perspective. You begin to look at what is inside. So David, his brothers, Eliab, I think, was one of them. You know, they look at the outside appearance. These are the people who are in the army of Saul. So they are strong, mighty men. But God says, Samuel, you are a good prophet. But here's the thing. You're making a mistake because you're looking at things from the outside. You are looking at it with human eyes. Human eyes won't tell you what will happen tomorrow because tomorrow there will be a Goliath Mm -hmm. who is of a much bigger stature. And guess what will happen to all of these guys that you're looking at? Fear will kick in. Fear will will kick in. They will sit there cowards. But then he says, there is one more in that house. Mm -hmm. So Samuel asked Jesse, are you sure these are all your boys? Jesse says, yeah, there is one more. I forgot about him. The oddball out there. The oddball out there. (laughs) You know, David did not take beef with his dad for forgetting about him when the prophet came over. You know, some some people, they'll take beef with that, but not David. Mm -hmm. He looks at the bigger thing, the purpose. This is the one. When he comes, the prophet says, that's exactly the one. So they anoint him. I can make a comment there and say, your yesterday is important to your today, but it's not your definition of today. It's important because God was using yesterday to train David. I like that. But that doesn't mean that that is what will define you today. So David is anointed. Then the Bible goes on to tell us God rejects Saul. And uh, the Philistine army rises up. They, they challenge Israel. During that time, Jesse tells David, hey, go check on your brothers in the army and give, uh, take some bread and bring back news of their uh, welfare. David goes there and it so happens that when David is visiting, that Goliath is challenging the army of God. David says, I can't take that. Tell him, well, there is a reward for whosoever will kill that man. He will get to marry the king's daughter. His family will be exempted from taxes. David's like, that's a, that's a good offer. I cannot let it pass. So he goes out there and he says, hey, send me, I'll kill him for you. Well, his own brothers, first of all, they doubt him. You and I are brothers. Yeah. The biggest mistake you can ever do is to ask me if you are able to do something. I cannot tell you that because my understanding of you and my definition of you is what you have done. It is never what you will do. And what you're capable of. What you're capable of. Yeah. People of the household, they know the things you have done, but they don't know what you're capable of. Well, Mm -hmm. sometimes they may, but it's always defined by what you have done. And sometimes not even just what you've done, but in comparison to what they've done also. Exactly. That because I've been able to do this, this is maybe as much as you'll be able to do as well. And that can be very limiting. Yes. For a person. Yeah. And one of the things there and just in that story of David, when he heard that Goliath was mocking his God, that's what triggered him the most. It wasn't the fact that the army, there was no one that could beat this guy because I'm sure if he, if Goliath wasn't mocking their God, he wouldn't have cared so much. He would have said, let me go back tending to my sheep. But the fact that he was mocking his God and no one was doing anything about that, that already tells you what kind of man David was. Yes. Above all else, he cared about his God. And there is no way a, an, an uncircumcised Philistine is going to mock my God. No, it's, it can't happen mm-hmm. to sit there and claim that we are a nation of God today. 
to claim that I am a Christian, I'm a child of God, but then your God is made fun of. You sit there, you have no defense. I'm not saying go the extremist way and execute people for challenging your God. No, your, your understanding of God should be challenged. Mm -hmm. And Paul said we must take every thought captive to the obedience of the word of God. Mm -hmm. So when people come and they challenge the word of God, you must be able to answer those challenges and defeat them with the word of God. So David is an example of a Christian today. How can you sit there and just listen to people tell you, for instance, an example just out of the blue, your God is dead, he doesn't heal anymore, and you just say, yes, that's okay. No, that shouldn't be the case. The Bible says God remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when someone challenges your God, it's not your job to go and defend God. God will defend himself. He'll use men and women. Sometimes you'll even open the ground to swallow people who make a mockery of him. But we must still be able to use the word of God. It's a sharp two-edged sword. That's what the Bible tells us. We must use the word of God to take all of these opposing ideas and reduce them to nothing and let God prevail. That's how I view the modern challenge of Goliath on David. That's so good. Let's go back to, the, to David again, that journey to the throne. As you were mentioning there, his journey to the throne begins with a food delivery. Yes. And we were talking about this earlier before we started filming, but let, let's talk about that because I found that so interesting. Yes. Uh, it, the boy is given the task of delivering food for his brothers. Now, remember, we are talking about purpose. The purpose here is to serve God as the head of the nation, as the king. But he must do the job of an errand boy. Just picture that for a moment. For someone who has been anointed to be a king, you are running errands. You are the errand boy. Mm. That shows you that there is no job too little for your purpose. You can't say, I've been called to be a minister, a mighty bishop, so this is below me. Mm -hmm. No, it, everything is important for you to get to where you're going. Every step. You Every step. Every step at a time. Yeah. Exactly. With stairs, you, if, you, if you skip one, you are at the risk of slipping and falling. Mm -hmm. You have got to go one at a time, one at a time, one at a time until you get your destination. Mm -hmm. So he begins with delivering food. The opportunity presents itself. Someone is out there defying their God. He stands and he says, I will fi I'll fight this guy. Hey, his brothers, they say, you, you're just a troublemaker. Go back home. No, I will actually fight this guy. Wow. The news gets to Saul. Saul says, are you sure? It's like, yes, I will go fight him. He takes the opportunity because your purpose does not advertise itself. Let someone remember that. The journey to destiny does not advertise itself. You have to take the opportunities. You have to grasp them. You have to know that this is for me. If I let this one go, I may never have another one. And on that same point, you have to be willing to move forward even when no one believes in you. Exactly. Because that's what happened to David. Even Saul didn't believe that a little man like this, when I have, I'm the biggest man in the kingdom, I have men like his brother Eliab, big men, they can't take down Goliath. And this little young boy, maybe 18, 19, is going to take down Goliath. Nobody believed that David was capable and fit for the job. But that didn't stop David from going. No, criticism should never stop you at any moment in mm -hmm. life. From the minute you were born, people talk about you. They criticize you. To the minute you will die, people will criticize you. Mm -hmm. You should never, ever stop what you are capable of doing because of the criticism. In fact, if you do not want to be criticized in life, be nothing, do nothing, say nothing. You might as well be dead. So if you're alive, expect critics. And sometimes they are there for a good purpose. Sometimes there is a man who said an artist needs criticism to perfect his product. So, yeah, he took it. It didn't deter him from his objective. He went to face Goliath. He went in the valley. Now, the weapons of war in his days were swords, uh, spears, they had shields, all of these, all of these things that uh, officers of the army, they put their faith in. David takes all of that and he says, not for me. I'll go there with what I'm used to. You have to figure out what you're good at. You have to try and understand what you're good at. And don't try to change the tools before the battle. You don't have experience with that. 
Use what you're comfortable with. David used what he was comfortable with. It was good enough to kill a lion. It was good enough to kill a bear. It's good enough to kill a Philistine. He went there with an assurance that these tools, they have given me victory more than once. They will give me victory again today. So he just picked up some uh, little rocks on his way. And the first one that he launched was enough to take down the giant. And sorry for cutting you off, but just that hits deep for me, man. Because you can think that the tools you have to do the job God has given you are not enough. Somebody else has better tools. For example, if God called you to be a musician, and maybe you play the piano, the keyboard, whatever it is, or you sing, you may always feel like, you know what, I don't have the best tools for the job. Somebody else has better. And you may be afraid to even begin because you say, my tools are not enough. I don't want to make a mockery of myself with what I have. But David didn't think about that in that moment. The king offered him the best of the best, but he said, you know what? It's the best for you, but you haven't been able to take down Goliath, although you have the best of the best. So I'm going to use what I have, what, have, what has gotten me to the point where I am here, mm -hmm. and I'm going to trust in God. And for the person who is in a position where they feel like what they have is not enough, I think that's a good message to leave today with, that what you think is not enough is exactly what God needs. Yeah. Because the smallest thing, when used by God, can do the impossible things. That's right. No one would have ever thought it was possible that a slingshot would take down a giant like Goliath. But it, it was meant to be impossible to show that it wasn't man's strength, it wasn't David's strength that did it. It was God stepping in, intervening, and using the little that David had, but David trusted in God. And God was able to turn that around. Yes. The Bible says that a sluggard says there is a lion on the way. In other words, he has an excuse for not getting up and not doing what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But then the same Bible also says a wise man sharpens his tools. So uh, one more example to help someone in that situation. Peter spent all night fishing. He didn't catch a fish. Jesus came and told him, throw your net once more. He didn't change the tools. He just obeyed God. Yeah. yeah. There, was a, there was a preacher one time I heard say, anything in its crude form, in its raw form, isn't worth much. But when you take the time to sharpen your skills, to hone yourself, train yourself day after day, night after night, it's only a matter of time before what you thought wasn't enough will bring you before kings. It'll yes. bring you before mighty men. Yeah. And there's a scripture in the Bible that says, find a man who is diligent in his work. That's a man who won't stand before mere men. It's very true. You have to be diligent in your work. Yeah. Whatever it is you may have, whatever skills you may have, you may think you're not the best piano player. You may think you're not the best singer. But it's not about being the best when you start. But it's about just training day by day and trusting that God will take whatever you have and add his anointing. Yes. And that's another thing maybe we'll speak about another day, what anointing does. Because anointing amplifies what's already there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's like a storm in water. It doesn't increase the amount of water in the lake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just amplifies it. Yeah. And so David, going back to David again, so he faces Goliath, he takes him down, and we find that his name starts being spread around now. Yes. From the guy who was a delivery boy, he was delivering food, now he's the guy who took down the biggest enemy the yes. army had. Yeah. And then from that point on. So what happens with David is a, a test of character. He kills the enemy of the day. Mission accomplished. His fame spreads quickly. Women begin to sing songs about him. A soul killed a thousand, David killed 10,000. Well, that's going to cause you problems because you have got a, an evil leader who won't like the fame to go to somebody else. You know, when people are so self-centered, they want all the attention to be towards them and they don't want God to use anybody else. Mm -hmm. So David, God is now using him because he has rejected Saul. Saul has a problem with that. Well, David, good luck. You have to now deal with Saul. Not only have you killed Goliath, now you have to deal with Saul, Saul who wants to kill you. He refuses to give him the daughter he promised to give. He now starts chasing him and he wants his head. He wants to kill him. David had all the rights to defend himself. But David is a man of integrity. He, had, he made mistakes later on in his life. And probably during that period, he also made mistakes. But David also looks at God and he says, I, I will not touch God's anointed. Mm -hmm. You can't say I'm a man of character 
and go out there and do something that is against the character of God. Mm. So he looks at Saul and he spares him a few times. The Bible bears record of twice where David had the opportunity to kill him, but he spared him. Yeah. So now he has to fight the man he was supposed to protect, or at least he has to fight the man who was supposed to protect him in this case. Um, they go on their back and forth until one day Saul dies and David gets the throne. The crown comes to David. David doesn't go to the crown. That's also something else that's very important. Many people today, they have their own reasons for pursuing their purpose. Many people, their purpose is the crown. David's purpose was not the crown. If your purpose is the crown, you will kill the person who's holding it right now so you can get it. But that wasn't David's purpose. David's purpose was to lead people. When you lead people, the crown comes to you. People acknowledge you as their leader. But when you impose yourself as the leader, you will have to, to do a lot of things that are not necessary to keep that reputation. Yeah. And it also shows you that you don't need the crown to lead. David, we already see he was leading men even before he became king. I, I think that there's a story of uh, the men who came to him in the cave of Adullam, men who were at the lowest of points, men who owed people money, they were in debt, others had been neglected. And then later on in the, in the books, we find out that some of these men ended up being great and mighty men, men who were able to take down a thousand people at once with a spear. Great men, I forget their names, but you can find them in the Bible. Uh, these were his generals. He became a leader even before he had the crown. Yes. A lot of people are waiting for the crown to become leaders. A lot of people are waiting for the titles, the jobs, in order to fulfill what God has called them to do. And that's where we fail. Yes. The titles, the crowns come later. You have to show God that even before the crown is there, you're still doing what he has called you to do. Yes. Many people lack the character of leadership. We look at the crown and we automatically say, if I have it, I'm the leader. A crown doesn't make you a leader. You can put a crown on a lion, it doesn't make it a leader. You can put it also on a goat and it won't make it a leader. Mm -hmm. yep. What makes a man a leader is his character. Jesus Christ was a leader. And one day a disciple came and said, Master, I will follow you. He said, Foxes have dens, birds have nests. The son of man has nowhere to uh, lay his head. But still, he is leading people, though he has none of those things. The leaders of his days were sitting in the palace. Herod was one of them. But Jesus was able to draw a crowd because of his character. And when we are speaking about purpose, we should always keep in mind that character to God means a lot. And if the character is not right, it will delay the blessing. Yep. So David, God was working on his character. There was one man in the journey of David called Nabal, I think. And you could see that this man, he really did dirty. He did David dirty. And David went actually to kill him. But uh, his wife, I think the name was Abigail, I think. She yeah. pleaded for him. Why? God was working on his character. And it's also a lesson for us. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. Just because someone wronged you doesn't mean you should pay them back. It's not worth it having innocent blood on your hands, especially the blood of your own people, the people you're meant to protect. So David is an example for all of us. If you have a purpose in life, look at the life of David and try to make sure you do the requirements. You work on the character before you go to the throne. Inheriting a throne prematurely will kill you. God has the power to give a man anything, but God is also not in the business of losing what he creates. So God can give you something that your character will kill. Yeah. And many times, that is what we do. And that is my personal problem with overnight fame. Overnight fame does not have character. Very rarely do we see people rise up who have the character of leadership. And there are not enough books in the world to transform a man into a leader. True leaders are created and made by God in the back of the wilderness. David, God was working on him where no one could see him. And when he presented him to the people, he was a man full of courage mm -hmm. that he could face the enemy that everyone was scared of facing. When he was challenged by Saul, he knew how to react because God had worked on him where nobody could see him. So God works on you where people don't see you, but it's a process. It's a process. It's not overnight. 
it took David, I think, 40 years for him to get to the throne from the time he was anointed. He could be wrong with the numbers, but it was a long time. Yeah. And since we're already speaking about character, what would you say are some character traits that a person needs if they're looking to fulfill their purpose? Because the theme of this conversation is how do I fulfill my purpose? What are some of the character traits or qualities that you need that you can think of? Maybe you can just number them, a few of, a few of them for us here, for our, for our listeners and myself. I am not a psychologist to answer that, but... Uh, Your expert opinion. On, yeah, it depends on where you're looking at things from. Mm -hmm. If you're looking from the Bible perspective, one of the characters that you need as a leader is humility. If you're looking at things from the Bible perspective, you have to be humble enough to humble yourself to God and to the people you're about to serve. The second character that is very important and is often undermined in today's generation is understanding. Most people know things, but they don't understand things. What's the difference? Knowledge is information that you have acquired. Understanding is the ability to put that information in its right place. So true. Yeah. And also with understanding, you should be able to convey that information to someone else in order to impart that knowledge in them. So many people today have knowledge, but they lack understanding. So that's already two. You said you're not a psychologist, but those are very two good points. So number one, you said it, it's humility. humility. Yeah. Number two, you said uh, understanding, not just knowledge. Yeah. So it's very important. You can, you can know a lot of things, but you don't understand a lot of things. Correct. And if you want to fulfill God's purpose in your life, you have to understand that purpose. And you also have to understand how you fit into that purpose. Yes. Any other points you want to share with us? I think the third one is obedience. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to obey the one who put you in power? No one gets themselves to the throne. Either people will vote you or God will put you there. Mm. Anyway, the Bible says all power comes from God. So when God puts you in power like he did with Saul, it was his disobedience to the one who put him there that cost him the throne. It wasn't David. It wasn't the Philistines. It was disobedience to God. Can you stay true to the mission after you have gotten the taste of power? Many people fail at their first cup of tea of power. But that cup of tea is nothing compared to the ocean of power that's waiting if you're willing to obey God and walk the distance with him. So those are the three things that I can think about off the top of my head. Thank Humility, you. understanding, and obedience. That's very good. I think of another one also. And to me, I started thinking about this this past summer. Uh, I, I forget where we went. We took a little road trip and you told me about a book called Extreme Ownership. For those who may know the book, it's, uh, it was written by these two military guys. It may sound like it doesn't fit into our conversation, but it actually does. Uh, that book, I, I bought that book after you told me about it. I read Extreme Ownership, found it very interesting. I actually did a presentation at work about that concept of extreme ownership. And uh, I'm not going to explain too much because it can take a lot of time from the discussion we have. But extreme ownership, or in other words, you have to be able to fully own your purpose to say that if I fail in my purpose, it won't be because of somebody else. I'm not going to blame you. I'm not going to blame you if I fail in my purpose. I'm going to blame myself. I have to take full responsibility that if God has given me this God-given purpose, I am responsible for the failure and the success. God is there. He has given me the purpose. He will provide the tools. He'll provide the training. He'll provide everything. But it's up to me to make a choice whether I will obey, I will be humble, I will understand, and I will execute. That, to me, I think is another quality trait that is very much needed when God has given you a purpose. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we like to shy away when things get hard. God has told you, you have to do this. Just uh, an example, maybe for those, you could be in the ministry and God has called you to be a minister, to spread his gospel all over the world. And you begin to face challenges. In that moment, it's so easy to say, you know what? These challenges are too much for me. I'm gonna stop the ministry. That's the easy thing to do in that moment. But extreme ownership tells you that's not what you would do. You have to analyze the situation. What makes this so hard? Whether it works or not is going to be up to me. Mm -hmm. And it's up to me at the end of the day to decide that I'm going to push through. I'm going to make it work. I'm going to find a solution together with God until I see it through. And if you haven't read that book, maybe we can link it in the description as well for people. It's a very good book. It has nothing to do with God, but if you take the principles from the book, you can apply them to any area of your life. I've applied them at work in my studies, in the ministry and everything, and I find the results are the same all across. Yes. When we talk about ownership of things, let me relate that back to the Bible. 
when Adam sinned, God asked him, why did you do that? He did not take ownership of his mistake. He passed the bucket to his wife. And the wife passed it to the serpent. Well, God didn't bother asking the serpent because he would have probably passed the bucket to somebody else too. There will always be the uh, proclivity in us to blame somebody else. But that doesn't mean we have been abdicated from that guilt. Just because you are passing the guilt to somebody else doesn't wash your hands clean of what took place. So we have to take ownership of things when you're working on your purpose. Mm -hmm. You do actually have to possess these things and take ownership of them. Mm -hmm. And speaking of David, by the way, that was one of his mistakes, his fatal mistakes in his life. When he killed the... Uh, the uh, Bersheba's wife. Bersheba's husband. husband. When Nathan went to confront him, he had to own up to it. If he decided to say, no, it wasn't my fault, you know, you're, you're lying, well, he'll be calling God a liar, but he's a man of integrity. He realized his mistakes and he owned it. He had to own the good things and the bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very good. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit. Same conversation, same theme. How do I fulfill my purpose? When we think about fulfilling purpose, there's a lot of things that can get in the way of actually being able to fulfill your purpose. And I think that's where a lot of us are. A lot of people are at the point where they know their purpose and they know how they need to fulfill it, but things keep getting in the way. And when I say things, I'm, I mean distractions. Because anything that's stopping you from fulfilling your God-given purpose is a distraction. Yes. You may consider it a priority, but I believe the number one priority in every believer's life should be to fulfill their God-given purpose. That's right. Beyond anything else, everything else must come after. If you know your purpose, you have to fulfill that purpose. But we know that's not always the case. Things get in the way. We call them distractions. Let's talk about some of these distractions. How does someone overcome the distractions that are stopping them from fulfilling their God-given purpose? Uh, well, some distractions are satanic and some of them are self-inflicted. Uh, when you read Joel 2, it speaks of restoration of the years that some uh, canker worms and caterpillars ate. Why does God need to restore the years? Because, so, well, someone else took them away from you. You were distracted. You lost years. Mm -hmm. Now, that has a spiritual application to it, but in the literal sense, yeah, you lost years. There are spirits, there are demonic creatures that are studying your life, and they will come to distract you so that you are blinded when you face the opportunities that will take you to your destiny, that will take you to meet your purpose. Mm -hmm. So how do I avoid distractions? You avoid distractions primarily by focusing on God and ignoring the environment around you, first of all. So I'm not saying neglect everyone and everything around you, but I'm saying keep your eyes on God. God told Israel when they were in the journey, keep your eyes on that pillar. If it moves, you move. So he's telling them, have a point of reference. Everything around you is a distraction. The nations around you, your enemies, what they are plotting uh, around you, the things in the camp could be also a distraction. Mm -hmm. But God says, no, keep your eyes on that pillar. When it moves, you move. So you have to keep your eyes on the signs of God, like on, on the word of God and the signs of the time. And then secondly, you need to understand something. Your purpose has its time in life. There are things that if you don't do today, they will never come back, but you will be held accountable. So Jesus, with all the might and power that he had, told us, I am asked to do the work of the Lord while it's still day. For night comes and no one works at night. Jesus was speaking of death. He is going to die and there are things he can't do anymore. So while he is alive, let him do what he can do during that time. And then the Apostle Paul says, redeem times, for the days are evil. So you're seeing from a spiritual perspective, there are spirits that just work on the human being to distract them. So many people today in the world are being distracted by forces they cannot understand. Break free from those forces first. The word tells us, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Amen. And uh, it's in the book of Psalms where the Bible says, the entrance of thy word brings light and understanding to the simple. So <laughs> let the word of God come in and keep your eyes on his word. It will help you understand these things that are distracting you and help you focus 
Zero in your vision on the purpose. Secondly, not every shiny thing is gold. On your journey to your purpose, you will meet a lot of things that are not your purpose. You will meet a lot of shiny things that are worth expending your money and time on, but they are not your purpose. So how do you stay focused? Learn to accept loss. Learn to accept that not everything is good for you. Some things may be good for your neighbor, they may be good for your brother, but they're not good for you because you are focused on your purpose. Yeah, that's very good. And distractions will always be there. And that's why they're called distractions. They're always there. But you have to make a choice because distractions are only good in the short term. Mm -hmm. But in the long term, distractions are never good. Distractions may feel comforting in that moment. It brings that sense of joy, that sense of pleasure in the moment. You know, when, for example, a student knows that they have an exam coming up, you, you know you have to study. But then your phone, you see some notifications, you go on your phone. That one, you say it's only going to take 30 seconds. 30 seconds can turn into five minutes. Five minutes can turn into an hour. Next thing you know, an hour that could have been spent preparing for the exam has been an hour spent on the phone. It was good in the moment, but in the long run, it wasn't good. Now, mankind has always faced distractions. The distractions that were faced in the previous generations may not be the same distractions we have today, but the point behind those distractions is still the same, to keep you away from fulfilling what it is you've been called to do. And I think the sooner that we realize that, especially when you're younger, there's a lot of time you can save and do things that you don't have to do later anymore. Yes. And the time you could spend today investing in yourself, improving yourself in knowledge and understanding, like you said, just simple things as having an hour every day to read your Bible or an hour every day to pray. If you begin to make too much of human beings to ask them to read an hour. Well, uh, if you think, Bible if you think about hour. having 24 hours in a day, an hour won't kill you, but maybe you're not there. It takes time to get to an hour. It could be 20 minutes, even 30 minutes per day. But if you begin to make these investments early on in your life, these are investments that will pay off in the long run. Yeah. But you're introducing discipline though. You have to have a certain level of discipline to tell yourself, for the sake of this, I will have to ignore that. It takes discipline. Many people today are not disciplined. Many people, they just sail through life, letting the winds guide them. They have no sense of direction. They are caught up with, in every wind of doctrine, every wind of teaching, every wind of pearly and shiny things, they go with it. And uh, that's not the right way to live. It just shows that you lack discipline. I would encourage people to have the discipline to actually censor themselves, to have the discipline to know that, okay, this is not good for me right now. You know, a, an example that I can think about is when you're planting your seeds, you only have a certain window to plant your seeds. Then you have a longer window to wait for the harvest. If you miss this window, you ain't going to get it back. So you have to know at some point Everything else must stop so that I can plant my seeds. Because if I miss this window, the season is gone. But if you're not disciplined, uh, you will say, I'll wait until tomorrow. I'll wait until tomorrow. I'll wait until tomorrow never comes, man. It doesn't belong to you. Yeah. And with the way life is, life is so busy that busy has become the new norm. And we don't have that time anymore to actually just sit down and reflect on our lives and plan and envision our lives. This is my purpose in life. How do I make sure that I'm always focused? And it doesn't mean that every single day you're going to be disciplined. It's normal. You will have some days where you wake up, you don't feel like doing anything that day. You wake up, you don't feel like praying. You wake up, you don't feel like reading your Bible. But it's those days that matter the most. When you know, I don't feel like doing this, but I'm still going to do it anyways. It's, it's those days that really matter the most. When you didn't feel like praying, you didn't feel like reading your Bible, but you still got up. And even if it was just for 10 minutes, it was just for 15 minutes, you still took the time to read your Bible. Those days will help you in the, in the long run. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like you're doing much in that moment. You know, that one day of prayer doesn't feel like you did much in that moment. But when you look back a year later and you realize that every day for a year or almost every day for that year, you prayed. Those are the days that then you'll realize that time that I spent, that investment that I made is helping me today. Battles you may face today, you don't know, but it could be the prayers you made a year ago that are helping you overcome the battles you're facing today. Mm -hmm. So if you only wait to invest in God's kingdom and his purpose for your life, when trouble arises, you're living on very dangerous ground. 
Yeah. So you have to begin to make these investments early. And the one thing that the Bible tells us for sure, like you said, whatever seeds we sow, we must believe we will reap from the seeds we have sown. Yes. It could be bad seeds or good seeds. We have to ask ourselves, what seeds am I sowing in my life? That's very important. Yeah, and uh, the Bible says if you, if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. Mm-hmm. So if you sow a few seeds, you will reap fewer. The harvest will be small. Mm-hmm. And if, you're, if you're, you planted a lot, you will reap a lot. So it's, it's, again, it's just basic life principles. You just have to be disciplined enough to put them in practice. Most people die for lack of knowledge. They die for lack of practice. It's not the things that you don't know that kills you. It's the things that you know, but you choose not to put in practice that end up killing you. And speaking of knowledge, there's one more point I want to discuss here before we wrap up for the day. There is so much knowledge out there. And we know as technology evolves and the amount of information and knowledge is, is being put out by people is increasing in the thousands and thousands by day. Every second, new information is out there. How do you filter? What information should you be filtering? And saying, you know, this information is good for me to move forward. The rest of this I'm going to put aside. How do you go through that? We can dedicate a whole episode to that. Give us the short version. The short version of everything is let God be true and every man a liar. So when you get information, you must have a filter. That filter of the information that you're getting should be the word of God. What doesn't agree with the word of God should get out of there. It's only what agrees with the word of God that should filter through, should go through and go to your inner being. Uh, There's a scripture in the book of Psalms that says, God spoke once, twice I heard. Mm -hmm. That's an example of that. Uh, And then Jesus said, give us each day our daily bread. The word of God is the bread of life. So how do I filter information? Filter it through the lens is the funnel of the word of God. But we can elaborate more on this in another episode to help people understand that also not every word applies to your situation. You have to be able to discern by the spirit what applies to you. Because the Bible says the Holy Spirit is our guide. Now, the word of God is direction. The Holy Spirit is the guide. You know the difference between the two of them? Thank for it. Okay, so... Uh, what I've gathered is direction is like a map. It gives you the road to get to from A to B. Guidance is real-time feedback on the road. So guidance tells you when you turn left, there'll be a pedestrian there, watch out. Direction doesn't tell you that. Most people have the word of God, it's direction. But it doesn't tell you there is a pothole on the road. It doesn't tell you there is construction there, you should avoid this one and take the other road. Guidance tells you that. So God tells us that his Holy Spirit is our guide. And the guide will help you filter what applies to your situation. Wow. Direction versus guidance. And you need both. You need both. You need both. You can't have one or the other. A guide without directions is useless. The guide is acting on the directions that you have, Mm -hmm. but he's giving you real-time feedback. Yeah. And it's like when you're driving with a GPS and you put in the address of where you want to go, it shows you, okay, it's going to take 17 minutes. And then... If it's being updated in real time, sometimes it says there's construction in this road. You know, it's going to take a little bit longer. Maybe take this detour. That's guidance, real time updates. And that's what the Holy Spirit is meant to do. Yes. This is the end goal. This is the journey you have to take. But along the way, we have to shift gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's a pothole there. There's a bump. We have to slow down here. It also tells you at what pace to go. That's a very good point. Wow. Thank you very much again for today. I think I've learned a lot also personally on how, how do you fulfill your God-given purpose. These have been encouraging conversations. And for those who are in that situation, in that position, we've covered a lot of things. Take the time to actually go back and re-listen to this again. One thing, I don't know if I've said this here on set, but personally I found in life you don't grow by learning you grow by applying. Yes. You can learn so many things, but if you're not applying what you're learning, you're just going to be a student forever. Always learning, but never applying. Yeah. There comes a point where you have to begin to apply what you're learning. And for as long as you're not applying, you're just getting knowledge, you're just getting information. But that information needs to be converted into usable facts and actually go to work. And that's what we hope to attain with this channel. 
the point of this podcast is for us to have these conversations, but beyond our conversation here, for people to actually begin to think about these things, reflect on their own lives, have these conversations with one another, and hopefully find some guidance in how they can position their lives to get to where God wants them to be. And so thank you again for coming here today and having this, this conversation with me here. I look forward to many more conversations and thank you to our listeners. It's been a pleasure again. Have a great night.